All right, might as well get started. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kevin Gunn. I'm coordinator of digital scholarship at Catholic University of America Libraries. Um, we are going to be talking about developing your scholarly digital profile today. I'd like to uh, show you a lot of tips and tricks and websites and different places where you can get started if you haven't started. And I'm hoping to, for those of you who are more established with your digital profile, that maybe give you some, some more ideas going forward. So uh, let us get started and get going. So, you know, the obvious question is why have a scholarly digital profile, right? I mean, it's very, it's good to have a thoughtful curator and professional academic web presence out there. And that means that your research is more likely be, to be discovered, read, discussed, and shared online. So uh, there's different ways that you can curate your uh, professional presence. Well, there are a lot of platforms out there for online academic discourse. So you have to ask yourself a number of questions before you even get started. You know, so what are your object objectives here? Are you uh, promoting uh, your own work? Are you trying to connect with uh, other people, professionals with similar interests? You want to have a dialogue with them? I mean, are you shooting for uh, trying to get tenure, or promotion or tenure? Those are sorts of questions that you have to ask, you know. Uh, secondly, you know, who is your audience? Are you going for just a handful of people? Are you looking at particular communities, uh, groups, that sort of thing who share uh, common interests with you? Um, you also have to look at your privacy. How are you going to manage your information going forward? You know, what is your social presence out there? Is that... Um, is that present something that you want uh, colleagues and uh, uh, other professionals to know about? Um, something you have to consider there. Um, also, you know, a very good question with a lot of online um, applications and that is, you know, how much energy are you willing to uh, devote to maintaining various um, websites and platforms and that? So you do have to consider some of these questions uh, going forward. So what counts as scholarship out there? You know, what do you want to throw up there on the web, so to speak? So you, you really have to think in a broad variety of what type of documentation that you're putting up there. So you see the list here uh, covers everything from articles and book chapters to data sets, grant reports, um, excuse me, blog posts, uh, Twitter posts, different types of learning objects, software code interviews. There's just so much out there. Uh, that, that's being created in the scholarly field that you have to consider what it is that you want to present out there. So in looking at ways to raise your profile, there's three different, I guess, umbrella groups um, that you have. Um, you can look to publish. Where do I, where can I get published? Um, that would help people discover my um, scholarly work. You know, um, where, what sites, platforms that I can use to promote my research effectively. You know, and last, um, you know, how do I measure what I've sent out there? Um, you know, is anyone looking at my work? Um, it's a very important question. And you have to understand that publish, promote, and measure, they're all interrelated. So, for example, if you publish, where you publish will impact some somewhat how you promote your research and measure its impact. So if something's behind a paywall, for example, it means uh, fewer people will be able to get access. Or to put it another way, they'll have to take uh, extra steps in order to get access to your work. So something like that has to be um, factored in in how you promote your research. So the big question is, you know, how do I get started? Where should I publish exactly? Well, you know, people's most common ways that people start uh, looking for information is just, you've written a paper, you, you want to get it published, you know, uh, look at the citations in your manuscript. Um, what are the journals um, that kept popping up? Um, are those possible titles that you can go consult with and find out um, if it's if your article would fit in with the content of that that particular journal? 
You can also ask uh, faculty and colleagues, you know, you're writing on a particular topic and you want to know uh, where um, would be the best journals that, uh, that would uh, be more willing to accept uh, your paper for publication. Um, one way you could find out if a journal, if your article would fit into a particular journal is to look at the website journal uh, TOC, table of contents. You can go in there, you can search for a particular uh, journal and you can look at the contents, um, just the listings, the table of contents for that particular journal. And you can get very quickly um, get a sense of what that journal publishes and, and uh, what it avoids. There's another site out there called Sherpa Romeo, a uh, very long uh, uh, um, stands for uh, uh, long acronym, acro acronyms that I can't, I can never remember, so they're all kind of obtuse. But anyway, um, this is, deals with the copyright um, whole issue of your articles and that. Once you write something, submit it to a paper, to a, to, to a journal, you know, what sort of um, rights um, do you have in terms of putting, for example, uh, your preprints on the web or your postprints on the web? Uh, sometimes publishers, uh, can lock it down. Sometimes they're quite open. So you really do need to uh, um, uh, think about that. Uh, another one that you want to consider is if you're really committed to um, open access, uh, there is a directory of open access journals that you can go check and see uh, how open those journals are, what they're willing to um, uh, publish um, and where and that sort of thing. A lot of these uh, particular uh, journals will have um, article processing charges. So they may have um, a site where, yes, you can publish open access, but you have to pay us several hundred dollars uh, to do that particular, uh, to do that particular uh, article in our journal. So you have to ask these sorts of questions. Um, as you can see, it all comes down to discoverability and shareability in that. So you don't want to pick the quote unquote wrong journal, then find out your, your, your paper is quite locked down. You also want to look at alt metrics, uh, alternative metrics is called, there's standard ways of measuring uh, impact for particular journal articles and that there's given the move to the online environment in the last 20 years, a lot of different types of metrics have moved online um, that could, uh, that could be useful for you in, in measuring your uh, research impact. The uh, problem is you have to be aware of what the limitations are, so specifically what they are measuring and what they are not measuring. That's something to consider. And then there's also a whole idea of traditional sources, for example, directories that you can, um, can um, research to find if they're they're uh, useful for you. So I've given you a few examples here, uh, things you should not forget, even though uh, they're more traditional sources, I put in quotation marks here. So there's Ulrich's International Periodicals Directory. Uh, they're, they're now online as, as Ulrich's Web Global Serials Directory. So they'll tell you a whole bunch of things, how often they're published, what's the content, what, how, uh, uh, how large are, is the subscription, subscriptions to the journal and all that sort of thing. Uh, Cabell's uh, is another one, it has directories of publishing opportunities, which is quite useful. And they break it down into various um, uh, subject disciplines. So if you just wanna look at business, they have that sort of thing there as well. You should not, uh, not forget about subject specific directories. So for example, the MLA directory of periodicals, that's the Modern Languages Association. Um, is a good place to take a look and see what sort of uh, um, journals would be listed there that would be, pertain to your topic. And I've, last one is publisher's journal uh, homepage. I often tell um, you know, uh, students just to go check the publisher's homepage and see what it is that they cover. They should have, if they're established, they'll have a nice um, uh, overview of, of the content that they're seeking and what, they are, what they're not interested in as well. All right, so as an author, um, you have to ask a very important question. You know, you have to protect your own rights. You have rights as an author, so you need to protect them. So, you know, the big question is how does the publisher treat authors? 
So you have to sort of look under th three different areas here. One are called predatory practices. There are a lot of predatory um, publishers out there who take advantage of uh, unwitting authors. And you can really get into a lot of uh, problematic um, issues with regards to um, submitting papers um, to journals that you think are peer reviewed, but in fact are not. They're just paper mills in the way. Uh, putting out stuff. So you have to look at that quite well. You have to look at the publishing agreements that you have with particular publishers. Um, some publishing agreements can be one or two pages. I think the American Chemical Society has something that's like eight pages long, so it, or even longer than that. So you have to really do read the fine print a lot on a lot of these um, publishers. And last, you have to look at open access as well. How, again, what, if someone claims to be open access, how open are they? You have to really delve into seeing um, what is there. Um, so just to give you a, a quick overview, um, if you've heard of predatory practices with, uh, uh, with regards to journals, uh, I should mention that, that this also pertains to, uh, let's say, journals, monographs, uh, conferences, and even... Um, acceptance letters uh, that you can have. So you have to be very uh, uh, careful uh, if you're being um, solicited by someone to come publish, you have to take a look into that, see how it, uh, what it is that they are requesting. Sometimes it's not very obvious. I will tell you uh, some obvious um, predatory practices here. Um, just listing them here, uh, you know, falsely claiming to provide peer review and meaningful editorial oversight of submissions. Um, if they claim that they can publish a paper in two or three weeks from the time you submit it, it's not going to, it's probably not going to be under that extensive peer review. So that's something you really have to uh, be mindful of. Peer review takes time. I mean, that's one of the problems with it, but it is sort of a slow, sober, reflective uh, thought on, uh, on doing scholarly work. So you have to keep, keep track of that. Um, quite often these uh, uh, publishers will have their websites where they're lying about affiliation with prestigious scholarly uh, scientific organizations and that sort of thing. And when in fact there's no affiliation there whatsoever. Or even better, so coming across uh, uh, affiliations with non-existent uh, organizations is, is pretty interesting. Um, you do have uh, one problem that keeps popping up and up over and over again is naming reputable scholars to editorial boards without their permission and then refusing to remove them. So even if you go to a website, check out the editorial board, and you have all these fancy uh, uh, people there with their PhDs and their years of experience and all that, it doesn't necessarily mean that the journal is legitimate. Um, I can tell you right now, as an antidote, I came across one particular nursing journal and the editorial board, the page for the editorial board looked kind of odd. So I started doing some research and, on one particular um, faculty member there and uh, she, um, she was claimed to be part of this organization, this and that, and it was basically false information. I did some basic Google searching and I basically tracked down that the information in there was kind of inaccurate, if not false. So I did follow up um, just out of curiosity, and I emailed the faculty member. She was at a new institution. And I emailed her, and I just said, hey, are you uh, on this editorial board? And said uh, she came back and said, no, I am not. Thank you for letting me know. So um, that stuff does happen um, out there. Um, a lot. One big... Um, Another uh, problem is that a lot of places um, will claim to have a high journal impact factor on their, on their website. And do not be impressed by that. Usually means um, nothing. Uh, I believe it's Thompson ISI. I think they're, they're the ones that uh, have copyrighted that journal impact factor notation. So if they're not, um, you know, if they're not, uh, affiliate with that journal, then basically the journal impact factor means nothing. Uh, hiding information about 
um, author processing charges until after your author has completed submission. This can be a real issue. There was one case where a faculty member submitted a paper, it was peer reviewed um, and returned and said, okay, we'll, we'll allow you to publish for you, send us 800 bucks, whatever. I said, well, wait a minute, I didn't agree to any of this. And basically the publisher would not release that paper so he could publish it in another place. So uh, COPE, if you've heard of that, is Committee on Professional Ethics. Um, what they they basically got involved and they said, you know, um, you're not be able, you're not going to get this paper back from them, but go ahead and submit it to another journal and let the editor know what's going on, and you know have it perhaps a note in the paper um, saying um, this is what's happening. That way, that way avoid the idea that um, uh, you know unethical charge of submitting a paper to two different journals at the same time. So you get into all these hairy businesses about that. So it's good to know what. Who you're dealing with before you submit your your work to someone and of course last i know one of the things that will falsely claims to be included in prestigious indexes um, they may be put in there one or two um, one or two years worth but then nothing more um, so that's something you do have to consider um, thinking about so cabell's uh, predatory blacklist um, they have a white list uh, and a blacklist. The whitelist you have to subscribe to, you know, the, the, the good journal, the good journals and good publishers to do that. They do have a blacklist of 64 criteria. Um, I put the um, URL uh, right at the bottom here. Um, so just to give you an idea, um, you can go to that page and they'll list a whole bunch of different um, um, criteria that, um, that you can um, look at and examine, and they generally fall under these general areas of integrity, uh, peer review, uh, the website, uh, publication practices, you know how they're doing their indexing, how they measure metrics, fees, uh, are they upfront with their fees or not? Uh, they have access and copyright. You know what do they tell you? Generally, what their business practices are. So, something to consider. Um, it's important to note that. You know, low quality journal publishing um, does not necessarily mean that it's deceptive or predatory. Um, it just may look kind of um, unprofessional, but it could be a legitimate journal nonetheless. So publishing agreements, um, what do you need to know about that? Um, always want to take a look at the website and you want to see um, what it is. Um, what rights that you have as an author. Um, Spark uh, is a scholarly publishing uh, um, organization um, that they have given, they've created a um, one page uh, PDF um, that has, is it's an author addendum. And basically what it does is that it, you can submit it to the publisher saying, you know, I want to retain all my author rights uh, going forward. And that doesn't necessarily mean that the publisher will agree. Will agree with it, but it does open a dialogue. And mostly uh, the established publishers will, will talk with you and see what you want and what you're going forward with. Sometimes some are more um, reasonable, if you will, than others. But here's uh, the top half of the, the addendum to publication agreement. And you'll notice right down here where it says, you know, author uh, retention of rights. You know, so it says, uh, basically, you have it, and you're allowed to um, put on various websites and that effort's been published and that sort of thing. You may get some pushback from the publisher, but like I said, it's a good way to open dialogue uh, with your publisher. So if you want to take a look at uh, a particular site, you know, are you submitting your research to a trusted journal? There's a great site out there called thinkchecksubmit.org. And I think what I'm going to do is just escape out of here. There we go. And I'm going to go right over to this site here. 
And this is a really great site uh, that you can take a look at to walk you through the entire process. Even a little blurb at the front to let you know, at the beginning to let you know. So you can think, what is it that you're working on, book, chapter, journals? I'm going to go to journals here just for fun. And it walks you through. Uh, is this the right journal for your work? So, you know, it, you have to ask questions. You know, more research is being published worldwide. New journals are launched each week. You know, most jour new journals fail after five years. You know, that's just one of the, one of those uh, gnarly statistics. Um, so you want to think about what you're doing if you want to look at, you know, publishers and that sort of thing. And then if you're looking at checking, you know, how do you go about um, verifying a good quality journal? You can look at Francis and Taylor and, and, and Elsevier and those folks, even though you're generally going to have a good, uh, a good idea of what it is that they want. So again, you know, you have these different questions that go through that they'll help you. I won't go through all of them here, um, but just to give you an idea. You know, the sort of questions and issues that you want to bring forth uh, to ask yourself, you know, um, everything from where it's indexed or archived and can be easily discoverable. That's going to impact um, um, how people uh, find your research and use it. So let's look at that. Oh, so here we have um, the Sherpa Romeo uh, website. So it gives publishers copyright policies and self-archiving. So, you know, you can send some, a preprint out there. It, are you allowed to do, put your preprint on your website? And once the article is officially published in the journal, do you have to take it down? You know, there's all these sorts of questions that you, uh, you, can, um, you need to be careful of um, in promoting your research. So... It's always good to check um, the Sherpa Romeo website just to see um, um, see what your options are. And I mentioned the directory of open access journals as well. If you're really committed to open access and want to go that route, well, here's a place that you can find uh, high high quality open access and peer reviewed journals listed here. So it, uh, it's another good place depending on what your particular uh, values if you want. Um, so that is promoting uh, research. Let me just go through here. Uh, that, pardon me. That is finding the publishers' websites and that and what's the best way to go about. So let's look at the next one, promoting your research. So how do you go about promoting your, your work? Uh, many, many, many different ways that you can do this. So uh, you can do researcher profiles such as ORCID, and we'll go into ORCID in a minute. I just want to show you that. You can do your personal websites, you know, curating your own material on your own site. Uh, there's blogging that you can do. Uh, there's various social media, you know, Facebook and Twitter and all that. Helps you develop a unique voice moving forward. Uh, another one is to start with your home institution. The COA's Office of Marketing and Communication actually has a, a, a form that you can fill out. It's for faculty and students and staff if you want to uh, have a conversation with them about how they can go about um, promoting your research. So that's a good, uh, possibly a good place to go. There's also the commercial uh, scholarly uh, networking uh, platforms out there, uh, you know, academia.edu and ResearchGate are a couple um, ones there uh, that can be very useful for you. And then there's also citation metrics as well um, that help promote your work. So open can mean uh, different things here. So you can have, um, you know, what are the reader's rights, you know, what sort of embargo um, as librarians, we know the different ways that journals can be locked up for, you know, two months, three months, a year, that sort of thing. So we always have to figure, figure out, you know, uh, you can publish it, but if it's not going to be in general databases, indexes for another year, so that's kind of annoying. But 
You also have Creative Commons licensing, uh, you, re, you know, reuse rights is also uh, something. If you have a data set that you're able to share and be reused by everyone, that's something that's going to get out there much more readily and used by people than something that, that is locked down. Uh, regarding copyright, you know, again, who has it? The copyright is the author or the publisher. Um, I mentioned author posting rights. Uh, where can you publish it? Can you put it in an institutional repository? What goes in the pre in, into the institutional repository? Is it preprint or postprint or what have you? Um, you also have to look at the costs of publishing. Uh, with regards, you know, the author or the institution uh, who's going to sort of foot the bill in that regard. And then, of course, you have peer review um, going forward. So how do you create your research profile? There's a number of different ways that you can go about it. Um, my favorite is ORCID. Um, the reason why I push ORCID is that it's free. Um, you can create your website. It's... Um, interwoven with other um, citation uh, software and websites. So uh, it's really um, useful in that sense. If you are, um, one of the nice things about ORCID is that they have it as part of their um, mandate that they'll never uh, sell out to anyone. It's strictly a, a nonprofit organization. So that's something that is very, uh, I think, most Researchers, scholars should have an Oregon account as far as I'm concerned. Uh, another one's uh, called Publons. They're formerly called the research, uh, formerly Research ID, and they're part of the Web of Science uh, universe. And I'll show you all that in a bit. Uh, there's also um, Scopus ID. Uh, I'm not too familiar with that, very sciencey, but it's also something uh, that you can use as well. And then there's also, as I mentioned before, ResearchGate and academic uh, EDU that uh, are uh, used by um, millions of people. So here is uh, the ORCID website here. And normally, uh, this is usually a hands-on workshop, so I have uh, uh, attendees come in and, and uh, uh, create their own site and move forward with that, and we talk about that. So, I won't necessarily do that right now. I, what I'll do instead is I'll show you my own site. There we go. So you just uh, log in, uh, create your accounts, pretty straightforward. Here's mine uh, listed here. And what's really great about this is a lot of publishers have signed on for ORCID. So if you submit a paper to uh, you know uh, Taylor and Francis or whatever uh, Elsevier and that, they'll often uh, they'll ask you for your ORCID ID, and that will go into the your particular paper. So if anyone wants to see uh, what else you've published, uh, if you're there, if they're looking at your particular article and want to see what else you published, they can click on that, and if it's assuming it's published by that. A particular publisher it will come up so you'll get a, a very quick um, very quick uh, uh, glance at it um, it also allows you um, to control very much what you want people to see uh, with regards to your to your work uh, you'll notice just down here uh, you know, it has website social links, so you link out. It also has uh, your particular IDs, so uh, research ID and scope as author ID are listed here. So if I were to click on that, let's see what would happen. Here. Oh yeah, so there you go. Eight publications have only been cited twice and have an H index of one. Well, okay, fine. Thank you very much. Not ex exactly ground shaking, but you get a really quick sense uh, of if people are using your research or not. So you come back here. You can look at this sort of a landing page here uh, discussing your um, employment as well as your education qualifications and then your particular works listed down here. And you can have these uh, imported from other sites, or you can uh, go into a manual um, 
uh, um, manual uh, addition to that. So you get a sense, let people know what is up there. It does take a little bit of time to set up in that, but uh, once you get going, it's not, it doesn't take all that much time to maintain it. And that's always a good thing. All right, so that is that. Um, I was just in um, Web of Science, uh, uh, Web of Science database, Publons, and if I can do this, so this is the dashboard summary for me there, not terribly exciting, but it gives you a sense uh, of what you have, the profile and your records um, listed here, and the different things that you can do with this. So. Again, Web of Science, it doesn't cover the universe, but it covers a lot. It's very much science-based, but there is humanity stuff in there and quite a bit of social science stuff, but it is very much science, uh, hard science-based. So something to consider. Um, you have manage your reviews and you can look at your uh, profile and that sort of thing. Let me see if I can pull this up. There we go. So uh, I logged into our university website, um, our, uh, a library website, and logged into our particular database. We do have the Web of Science. You'll notice up here all the different ways, you can, stuff that can be cited, insights, uh, you know, um, journal citation reports, that sort of thing. In this case, uh, we're in uh, Publons. And you'll notice here, this is uh, kind of interesting, um, the convergence or integration of various uh, platforms and that. Um, you work on one thing and it will show up on another website. I think it's very important, it's very much saves time in ma maintaining your profile online. So that is a very quick thing here, let's see. There we go. So you have the dashboard summary listed here. Oh, come back here. Oh. All right, so you can import publications. Here's my stuff that's listed here. Um, Obviously, it's not complete by any stretch of the imagination, but it does um, provide um, a listing of material here. And you can queue for update from other science if you want to see if anyone's checked this stuff out recently. So very quick um, examination of that. All right, let's go back. All right, so ResearchGate versus uh, academic, academia.edu. So these things do um, a lot of different um, functions. They're social networking sites, but you can put in um, your own uh, material. Um, some, they are for-profit sites, so you do have to be careful uh, of what you, uh, what you can use and that sort of thing. Uh, so you can track citations, downloads, and that. Uh, you do have to register. And one of the problems um, with registering, at least if you're a user, if you if you do a Google search and you discover one of these articles on a particular website, uh, they quite often they'll have you want to, you have to uh, uh, register first before you can uh, download the material. So you're giving up a little bit of information on that. And definitely some people don't want to do that. Um, so, something to consider if you're up there. Um, Lisa Hinchcliffe, um, I think, oops, spell her name there. Anyway, um, anyway uh, at her web library research guide, she has uh, a, a particular uh, handout 
uh, that compares research gate with uh, academia, edu, if you just wanted to see how they handle different things like profile options and discovery and search and content sharing and that features and that. This is a few years old. I think it's about four or five years old. So it's possible some of these features um, have changed, um, but it is an interesting comparison um, of what uh, they will allow in that. So um, it's always good to find uh, any sort of comparison out there is usually better than having no comparison. So you get sort of an informed um, examination before you decide to go with one or the other, or perhaps even both. So at you know, academia.edu, uh, um, it's quite large. Apparently, they have over 121 million academics have signed up for it. And you know, they have over 25 million papers they claim in that. So it is a quite a bit of a, a large hub. Um, Research Gauge is a bit smaller, it only has about 16 million users. So again, you know, how, how do you want your material to be discovered? Always a good question to ask. So posting to social media, you know, what is questions you have to ask, you know, what's relevant to your desired audience? Um, you do not want to post uh, material that is um, not related to what your audience is because it's just going to fall flat. Um, you also want to look at reflecting, you know, what is your personal professional values and ethics? Again, I mentioned open access for a lot of folks out there. Open access is, uh, is almost a religious thing. They're going to do that. They're not going to go with any sort of um, a publisher uh, where you have to uh, pay money to get access um, to journals and that. So um, something that you have to consider with regards to your own ethics and things when you're doing social media, you have to consider how you know what, what would be uh, what you're putting out there would be potential would be happy for a potential collaborator or grant administrator or a current student to see. So you have to keep it, like I said, professional and and looking at uh, how people are going to view you and perceive you. Um, so social media sharing, here's a number of different um, sites up here, uh, sort of put together um, different way, sites that you can take a look at. Google Scholar Citations, um, I think quite a few people already have, Google, if you're going to start somewhere, Google Scholar, uh, Scholar uh, site is a good place to go. Um, you can look at uh, Impact Story. Um, if you want to talk about, you know, if your, your research has a story, that's a good place to go. Um, you can look at Publish or Perish. It's designed to help individual academics to present their um, research in the best way. Um, there's also uh, the Metrics uh, Toolkit. If you want to take a look at uh, that site is... Uh, resource for researchers and evaluators that provide guidance for demonstrating and evaluating claims of research impact. Uh, so a very good place to start. There's also the website Kudos. So as it's sort of a website is ex explained as, you know, explain your research in plain language and manage how you communicate around it so you can understand how best to increase its impact. So that's a site uh, worth looking at. There's also a Mendeley, uh, which I think most people uh, know about. It's owned by Elsevier. It's a free reference manager and academic social network that can organize your research. You can collaborate with others online and discover the latest research in that way. So some very useful tools there. Here's an example of Impact Story, um, just using this fellow named Ethan White. Uh, just sort of gives you a very quick snapshot um, of his site and what uh, what um, he's working on and also what sort of impact it's had out there. And he lists his particular publications um, here and also, you know, co-authors and that sort of thing. Uh, we talked about, you know, your, your journal articles and that, but one thing you need to understand, open access repositories, 
Um, they deal with a lot more than what's just uh, that's what you just see. Um, just a regular journal article. So, for example, uh, Figshare allows you to upload any file fa format to be previewed uh, in the browser so that any research output from posters and presentations, data sets, and code uh, can be disseminated. So, it will provide a DOI on request, which is always uh, a useful thing to have. Um, I think most of you have probably seen, uh, heard about GitHub before, so you can build projects, share content and code, and collaborate on open source uh, technologies. Another one is Zenodo. Uh, it's a research data repository, um, so uh, it can be integrated with GitHub, and you can also create your own uh, DOI if you need to. Um, there's also the Open Science Framework. So it's free and open source project management support for research across the entire research life cycle. Uh, we will actually be doing a webinar. Uh, Lee Wade, who's our STEM librarian, and I will be doing a webinar in a couple of weeks where we'll be showing, uh, demonstrating the open science framework and how useful it can be, uh, not only for scientists, but also for humanities and social science folks as well. It, it's quite versatile. So we thought we'd do a webinar on that. Um, for those of you in strictly in the humanities area, there's the humanities core repository, and they cover everything from course materials, white papers, conference paper, conference papers, code, digital projects, articles, and monographs, and that sort of thing. So, and of course, this archive. Uh, uh, this is it's a preprint repository. is one of the oldest OA resources, and it does cover primarily sciences, physics, and mathematics, but still a useful place if you're working in those areas. All right, so the last area I want to talk about is tracking your research. Um, there's a number of good um, librarian websites out there. Uh, in this particular case, I point to Florida State uh, University Libraries. Um, talk about alternative citation metrics and all the different things that you can take a look at. Um, things to consider when you are evaluating um, where uh, how you can um, determine um, if something's been used in that. So, for example, uh, let's go back here. So, here is the site, um, and it'll give you uh, how to find uh, alt metrics, the types of alt metrics that are listed out there. Um, there's just quite a bit that's available to you. So you have, you know, you, you know, what is it that you want to measure? Are you looking at article level metrics, journal level, author level, you know, and then they're broken down further into different um, particular indices that you can. So if you're looking for book and book chapters, these particular sites here would be very useful. So Web of Science, Scopus, uh, Google Scholar Citations and Google Book Citations uh, are a good place to go. Uh, World Cat Holdings, hey, you want to know how many people have purchased your book? That's a good place. Uh, to check that out. And you notice of articles and working preprints, working papers and technical reports, but you also have data and software and posters. Uh, anything that you turned out, if you remember, um, I had the web page up there, uh, pardon me, the, the slide showing all the different types of scholarly outputs you can have. All that material can be measured to a certain degree. Um, so it's something uh, um, that you should think about, sort of like the big picture, if you will. Let's see. All right. So here's another site from Cornell University, their research guys, just using as an example, the H index, um, you know, which measures uh, individual author level metrics. So, you know, web science has it, the web of science has it, but it's not, you know, exhaustive in that sense. So you always have to keep that in mind. Uh, so quantify your research output by measuring author productivity and impact. So you have number of papers with a citation that's greater, citation number is greater than uh, H. So give an example of a scientist with an H index of 37, that's 37 papers cited at least 37 times. So there are advantages and disadvantages to each of these indices. Um, the advantages for the H index allows for direct comparison within disciplines. It also allows measures uh, quantity and impact by single value. 
um, but there are disadvantages as well. So it does not give an accurate measure for early career researchers. Um, it's not going to show a lot, especially that's a bit of a problem if you're someone who's uh, seeking uh, tenure, for example. Uh, again, it's calculated by using only articles that are indexed in the Web of Science. So you can't really rely on one particular tool like the Web of Science. You have to use other ones like Google, scholar citations, and that sort of thing. So, let's see. so I mentioned you know, impact metrics, Web of Science, Google Scholar. There's also the PLOS One uh, for scientists, if you want to check that one out as, too, as well. Um, Again, metrics, how, how your institution uses them and uh, for assessment, something you'll have to have a conversation with with regards to your uh, university administration and your department and your school and that sort of thing. So uh, Jerry Muller uh, wrote a book about three years ago called The Tyranny of Metrics, and he has a good quote. He says, not everything that is important is measurable, and much that is measurable is unimportant. So you may, you know, some limitations of impact metrics include, you know, recent articles, newer journals and researchers who are at an early stage of their careers, as I mentioned, or if they publish in languages other than English, maybe underrepresented uh, by impact metrics. So, you know, publishing frequency and types, you know, for example, books versus journal articles, they can vary from one field to another and precluding comparisons across different subject areas. Uh, we have one faculty member who, uh, who does medieval Islamic philosophy. So it's virtually impossible to use any of these metrics to measure because there's maybe four journals out there that deal with medieval Islamic philosophy out there. So very difficult in that sense. So authors can frequently cite their own work and, and in their own, in other papers and, and sort of goose their numbers um, to make them look quite positive. Impact uh, metrics also focus on the volume or attention received rather than the quality of the research. So it's better off to publish one really good journal article in a high quality journal than 10 articles in a lesser quality journal, so to speak. So having a large number of citations is not necessarily a marker of merit as articles may be cited for negative reasons. So, and that's a, you know, an issue that predates the internet, the World Wide Web with regards to, to citations. So best practices and tips that you can follow, you know, maintain your profiles, um, be sure you're on top of that. Be consistent in citing your work across various platforms. Uh, use your full name. Uh, one of the advantages of Orchid is that if you use different versions of your name across different publisher sites, you can bring it all into one umbrella, uh, under one umbrella with uh, your right name. Uh, you can keep discoverability in mind. Um, you know, Twitter name, what's your Twitter name, uh, your ORCID, your DOI, so publications, that sort of thing. And then you can cross-link your different profiles in ORCID so you have free and open access in that sense. Also, um, if you really want to get started uh, doing this sort of thing, you can take a look at this book. I think this book's about five years old, but it's still useful. It's just looking at it. It's called the 30-Day Impact Challenge, and it can help you set up your various profiles in Google. And, and websites and all that sort of thing. So, um, and that is basically the presentation there. Um, let's see. There you go, and I'm gonna stop presenting. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, do you have any questions that you would like to ask? Oh, let's see. Hi. All right. Well, um, 
I'm not hearing any questions. Uh, if you have any follow-up uh, questions or you have a problem with particular websites, because some of these sites can be quite uh, involved, um, do do reach out to me and talk, and we can have a conversation. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, I appreciate it. Uh, I don't do webinars all that often, so <laughs> uh, any positive feedback, great. Any negative feedback, I'll use that too to improve. So. Um, I hope you don't feel overwhelmed by all this. Um, uh, it is being recorded, uh, the webinar, so I'm hoping that we can share so you can take a look at the websites and that. I'm happy to send my uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation to anyone who uh, emails me. Uh, that's gun, G-U-N-N, at coa.edu. All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Take care. There we go.